Thank you very much. Great uh, project, Jock. Uh, you know, if you uh, find one of your mangroves and you can see the molecules that uh, they're sequestering away of CO2, and you trace them back upstream, a lot of them will start in the terrestrial water. And this project that I'm going to describe is an effort to look at uh, actually gauging how much uh, our cities produce, and particularly Brisbane, in terms of, uh, of CO2. So um, I think it's worth noting right at the beginning and in uh, uh, just acknowledging the, the Gubby Gubby people and the, the Jagger and Turbal people in Brisbane where the project is based, that in one single human lifetime today, CO2 levels on the planet have increased by as much as they fluctuated over the last 60,000 years of indigenous occupation of this land, and indeed back as far as 800,000 years. So. Um, so, yeah, 800,000 years, the fluctuation of CO2 levels has been 120, uh, a span of 120 parts per million, and that's about the increase in one human lifetime uh, currently. I don't think I need to tell this audience about the seriousness of this issue. Uh, we just passed a rather uh, bad landmark this last week, even if only temporarily, even if it goes back down again, it will go back up beyond our we're probably looking at about three degrees of warming. We know that virtually all the things that people in this audience are interested in will be affected by this, these changes in coming decades. But I think it's fairly extraordinary when we look at the really exceptional temperatures this year and the thick black line on the top shows that we've actually been going now for several months with really record-breaking temperatures around the planet. Um, I had uh, the great I think fortune, I think students perhaps had misfortune of teaching statistics to undergraduates. And uh, I told them they would come to know and love the standard deviation. But when we see temperatures that are not just one or two standard deviations above the mean, but four, five, and six standard deviations above the mean for months on end, I think uh, the world's decision makers should be in panic mode. But in Australia, we're approving new uh, fossil fuel projects and using public money to do it. CO2 is measured, obviously, by the professional scientists around the place, uh, and governments uh, organize their scientists to contribute to an international database on uh, CO2 measured at uh, higher in the atmosphere. And you know, if we look a uh, lot more uh, locally, we have um, down in Cape Grim, on the northwest edge of Tasmania, is CSIRO's uh, station to produce that sort of data. We have uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii from NOAA and other contributors from around the globe. But they are looking at uh, clean air. They, they want to sample um, air that is not being contaminated by local sources. They also use very sophisticated gear and professional scientists to do the measurements. So uh, not exactly citizen science to use that kind of uh, apparatus. Uh, nor indeed do citizen scientists uh, staff the uh, flux towers, which measure exchanges of carbon dioxide between and the other gases between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere in very localized areas, uh, such as the work done by TURN in a number of places around the country. And those towers are typically not in urban areas. But it's indeed in urban areas where most of the stuff is actually produced. And finally, of course, again, absolutely the opposite end of the spectrum from citizen science is uh, NASA's uh, satellite observations. So uh, I remember as a student in the University of Birmingham in the UK measuring CO2 for a lab exercise in 1974 at about 335 parts per million, which is where this graph begins. And uh, in that, uh, in the intervening period, of course, it's risen and risen and risen above now 420 parts per million in that clean air, relatively clean air, uh, uncontaminated at least by local sources. If we plot this a bit differently, and we plot temperature against carbon dioxide concentrations, we can see just what a tight coupling there is, and therefore we know the trajectory that we're on unless we uh, take pretty serious action pretty quickly. So the goal of this particular uh, project, uh, which is a local environment group in Chapel Hill in West Brisbane, is to try to get a handle on the levels of carbon dioxide actually at surface level in the city where it's produced. So unlike uh, NOAA or CSIRO, we actually want to know what the local sources and sinks might be, and we want to, to actually capture that directly. Um, 
And the surprising thing to me is that this is actually not routinely measured. There are very, very few cities around the world who actually even attempt to measure this. It's partly because of CO2 is not considered a contaminant. So unlike air quality measures of SOx and NOx and particulates, it simply has historically not been part of the, uh, the measurement regime. The basic idea here is going to be public education because uh, people tend to think of global warming as a global issue that's remote from them. CO2 is in colorless, odorless gas. It's far away from us. It's not our problem. But if we can get local data, we have a be perhaps a better chance of capturing local attention on uh, emissions. And in a, as well, we can go and look at some other issues to do uh, with, uh, for example, seasonal changes, weather effects, and so forth. The gear we're using is a uh, uh, non-dispersive infrared CO2 sensor made by a Swedish company. Of the 30 or 40 products of this type available, this one is, uh, I think, the best. We've had now enough experience with it to understand its characteristics really well. Uh, one downside, it's low cost. One downside is that uh, it has to be corrected for hu relative humidity, temperature, uh, and uh, air pressure, which uh, I'll just show you a little bit about. And because the project has been developing over a period, I'm going to emphasize a little bit more the, 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 the why and the how rather than the what, although I do have a result for you at the end, so you see where this is heading. So the sensor is uh, just run with a Raspberry Pi Zero computer, and uh, we also measure the the three key variables of air pressure, temperature, and relative humidity, so we can adjust for those. And it's all networked. So uh, on the left-hand side is an early model. You can see we house it in us BBC tubes and flower pots uh, supplied by Bunnings Scientific, that well-known scientific supply house. And uh, you can see one of the monitors up uh, outside the hut in Chapel Hill, West Brisbane. Here we're calibrating the uh, three sensors in uh, sealed containers with a fixed CO2 concentration. And uh, we can adjust for, uh, using a syringe, we can adjust and adapt the pressure and measure the response of the sensor to just pure pressure changes when gas is constant. Similarly, uh, we can absorb moisture from a very humid air and let that change over several hours and see the effects of humidity. And finally, we can put ice packs or uh, uh, heat packs underneath and change the temperature and look at the temperature response. So I'm going to show you some data from that in a minute. Fortunately, all these things are very easily available, so you don't have to go to specialist places to get most of the equipment. And indeed, we can calibrate with CO2, inject known quantities of CO2 uh, from very readily available sources. In fact, the only really specialist uh, thing here is the 400 parts per million specialist calibration gas supplied with help through Alistair Grinham our colleague at UQ who's uh, been assisting with this. So here's a typical day's data from a single sensor in the outside air. And I just wanted to show you what the effects are of these different variables. So that's 24 hours worth of data. Uh, this is an offset shown when you do the calibration, the 400 parts per million, and the span calibration up to about 520. But uh, fixed temperature, fixed humidity, and fixed pressure. When we uh, adjust for uh, air pressure, and we're at sea, we're close to sea level really in Chapel Hill, so it doesn't change it too much. The big change is if we take into account humidity, because during the daylight hours, when the sun comes up, humidity typically drops, and that can lead to an underestimate of CO2 using these kinds of sensors, but we can adjust for that, and this would be the adjustment for humidity by itself. But what also happens is that uh, temperature shows a almost inverse correlation with humidity. So during the daylight hours, temperature goes up, humidity goes down, so they almost offset one another. And when we put these all together, the last purple curve is the final calibrated output. So we're pretty confident we're getting as accurate a data as we, we can reasonably out of a relatively low cost sensor. The whole thing is in a network, so uh, it takes only a couple of keystrokes now to uh, download all that data every day to the, uh, to the laptop run a set of analysis programs, apply all the calibrations, summarize the data, and uh, upload it to a website. And if you go to, to ico2n.org, you'll see yesterday's uh, data up there. I uh, just want to walk you through a typical, uh, what the curve looks like for a typical day when you've averaged over many, many days. And there is this daily cycle. So there's three things I want to point out about this particular graph. The first is that 
the average level, the blue line is the average, plus or minus one standard deviation is over several months of data averaged for our city center site in Brisbane. And uh, you can see the average level is probably about 440 parts per million. So that's 20 parts per million higher than the well-mixed air background level. And that is an indication by itself of how much the city is a source of CO2 on average year-round. The second thing is that we can get data that is pretty comparable to that from professional groups using very expensive equipment uh, and analysis. So that's data from Munich using some of the gear I showed you earlier. And we get very, very similar results. So uh, that's uh, somewhat comforting. This, the third thing is just to walk you through this daily cycle. So it starts at midnight and ends at midnight. Uh, what happens during the hours of uh, darkness just before dawn in the left-hand side is that uh, CO2 is trapped by the um, atmospheric boundary layer, uh, which is fairly low overnight. Uh, also, there's respiration from vegetation. So CO2 sort of builds up to a peak. And then as day breaks, the sun starts the winds going, the air mixes, CO2 levels drop, photosynthesis starts. So it starts to suck up some of that uh, gas and it reaches a, a low in about the afternoon and then builds up again towards the end of the day. And that's the typical cycle when you average over many days. Any given one day could look vastly different to that pattern. So I want to just share one early result. This is the average of uh, several months worth of data again in the city center, uh, where I separated out weekend and um, weekday data. So the blue line is representing weekdays and the uh, uh, orange line weekends. So you can see there are two periods uh, that coincide roughly sort of peaking about seven in the morning, seven to eight in the morning, and in a longer period in the early afternoon to, to late afternoon where CO2 is higher in the weekday, on weekdays than it is at weekends in the city. That's almost certainly associated with traffic patterns. The portion at the beginning where weekends are actually higher, the reason for that very likely is that uh, Saturday starts at the end of the week. And so all the accumulated CO2 from the week's um, traffic starts out at the beginning of the Saturday. And that, that elevates the weekend average. And in fact, we can see that if we go up to the next slide, where I pulled Saturday and Sunday apart. So the light green is uh, Saturday. That starts out really high just after midnight. Sunday is a lot lower. Uh, that's the dark green and Sunday stays low and ends up the, the lowest of all the days of the week and drags down the beginning of the next week's weekday data. So we're fairly confident we can get, make some interesting inferences from this. It's going to be even better when we've got multiple sites up and can look at patterns across the whole city. So far, our three sites are at Petrie Terrace uh, downtown, uh, Chapel Hill, where our uh, association is, and out of Bellbird Park near Ipswich, which represents an outer suburb. We've also got a, uh, a reference site down at O'Reilly's, uh, which has rather poor communication, so we need to probably beef that up a little bit to make it more useful. And to conclude, uh, the next steps in this project, which have been a, a little while in the making because we had to get the methods right in the first place and be confident about the quality of the data, uh, but basically is to get up a network of a roughly about a dozen such sites around Brisbane, because then we can really make some good inferences about sources and sinks, patterns, wind effects, weather effects, traffic effects, all those sorts of things. Uh, we want to grow the analysis capacity so we can look at more, uh, more questions. We can do some targeted short-term campaigns with mobile versions of this, including use of GPS. We have piloted this with a, a bike. It's simply to do sort of transects to look at differences between vegetated and highly built up areas, those sorts of questions. And that will be the opportunity, I think, for us to involve more people in this project and make it more like a, a, a true citizen science rather than, as my wife sometimes points out, a single citizen science project. So uh, that's where we are on this one. And uh, maybe at a future occasion, I have some more results to share with you. So thank you. OK, Charles, well, that's fabulous. It's very close to my heart. Seeing my PhD was in micrometeorology, forest micrometeorology. Um, I think it's great. I like the fact that it, it's growing. And, um, you know, if you're looking for a rural site, you know, maybe we can chat about Mapleton, which is up here on the range. I know it's out of Brisbane, but uh, any questions for Charles about, about, his, about his talk? Okay, 
Charles. I'm really glad that you came. I had no idea Thika was doing this type of stuff. I have actually spoken to Thika a number of times about citizen science, so it's wonderful to learn. Um, and also, uh, I'm just curious if you can speak a little bit to things like when you're going to recruit future stuff, like are you interested in altitude gradient? Like, you know, do you want to work with the Bush Care Group doing stuff on Mount Kutha and things like that? Well, absolutely. I think there's certainly a potential to do that. So uh, we, if we formulate the right sorts of research questions, I think that's completely doable. But interestingly, some people do take these up on um, uh, drones, mm -hmm. but you have to go fairly slowly because the pressure changes need to be, a, there's a little bit of a time lag with the pressure change. So um, yeah, there's lots of questions that can be looked at uh, there. I look forward to that, yeah. Great, thank you, let's chat. Up right up the back. Thank you so much, that was incredibly interesting. Um, I too am from Brisbane and I know how much Brisbane City Council uh, values their sustainability initiatives and their green values. Is this information shared with them? Is this something that they're particularly interested in in looking at their um, baselining where they're at and monitoring how they're going with their initiatives and if it's having any impact? Well, I really do believe it could shed some light on those. Uh, and I think probably our preference would be to keep it, in a sense, as an independent project. It, I think it does have a role in providing information that policymakers can use and uh, uh, council obviously would have an interest in knowing whether certain uh, projects are actually having the effect that they, they would like it to have. So by looking, for example, in a local suburb, if we can examine differences between CO2 concentrations before and after some revegetation project, those sorts of questions, absolutely, we could uh, try to make some inferences about that. So yeah, I think it's relevant to council, but we'd probably keep it as an independent project. Hi, Sienna here from Brisbane City Council. Um, <laughs> uh, I was just uh, reaching out based on your sites and stuff and noticing um, some gaps and just wanted to know if you were interested in utilising maybe some of Brisbane City Council's sites like our environment centres, so Boondal Wetlands, Downfield Creek at Chermside or Karawatha on the south side. Yeah, that's, that'd, be, that'd be great because uh, actually getting representative sites is one challenge. So these three sites are on private uh, property or at least in the hut it's, uh, we rent from council. But the other two sites are private property. Um, and uh, it has to, uh, we need really sites which are fairly typical of those locales. So we don't want to have you know, like a, right next door to an, uh, an air conditioning outlet or anything like that. So as long as it's not it's an appropriate site, yeah, we'd be very keen to look at, at those possibilities, absolutely. So Charles, did you get any um, data collection during the lockdown or do you start after that? Yes, we do have some data on that. Yeah. Um, at that stage, this has gone through various phases to develop the methods and develop the calibration. So I'm a little wary of, you know, depend, depending on the quality of that data too much. Um, so I, I choose not to sort of share that really at this stage. Other groups have done some really excellent analysis of that, by the way. There are a couple of other networks of this type, one in the Bay Area in San Francisco, they have a lovely, uh, that's uh, run from Berkeley, UC, UC Berkeley, and they have a, ver a very nice uh, depiction on their website of COVID effects, uh, you know, lockdown effects there, for example. Yeah. I guess very sadly at that kind of global level, we, we had that dip during the, during the COVID times, but unfortunately we're tracking back probably worse than ever globally, uh, so <laughs> that's the sad part about it. But I think to get the message out there, about CO2 and, and by having it something you're doing with, with citizen scientists, I think it's very powerful uh, as your overarching aim of what, what you're trying to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and the science as well is very interesting, but also just the messaging that would come out of that. That CO2 isn't harmless, it actually is. A po it's a greenhouse gas uh, and uh, most our most common greenhouse gas and it warms the planet, basically. Yeah, just as an aside, for those of you uh, more in the sort of natural science area. It's quite interesting that there's some evidence that some insects, for example, there are direct effects of CO2 levels independent of the effect of heat produced by global warming. Uh, so there's a study of dung beetles showing that they reproduce less well 
uh, under enhanced CO2 levels. So there may be direct effects of CO2 that we're not even really aware of yet. Thanks very much, Charles. Very interesting. Thank you.